I just worn off um, chewing coca during live streams, but today uh, decided to go ahead and have a quid, partly because we're going to talk about it um, in conjunction with some of the other plant medicines. And so, if you guys follow my channel, uh, before we get into the plant medicine, I, I think maybe we're out of range of the internet. I might have to walk a little closer to the house. Can you guys hear me? Somebody, anybody? Can you guys hear? Is there audio? Somebody let me know. Hello, hello. Going to try to stream outside, but it looks like the internet connection isn't strong enough, so give me a second to get back upstairs. Looks like we lost everyone. <clears throat> Give it a minute, see if anybody jumps back on. Okay, hello. Sorry about that. I wanted to stream from the front yard, but the connection is not good enough. So, uh, the other day, in one of my streams, I mentioned that um, I was feeling really really positive for no good reason. And then something just fell out of the sky today. So, you know, I've been talking a lot about how it's okay to believe in miracles because the universe is made of them. And, you know, one of the main themes of my channel is that if you're acting uh, in congruence with your higher self and acting in, in, in the best interest of the collective, you'll find that things miraculously work out. And I think I've demonstrated that for anyone following this channel over and over again for quite some time. And I hope you guys are taking notice and drawing inspiration from that. Um, and I know this is a weird time for me to stream, but according to YouTube analytics, this is the busiest time. And based on the fact that there is one person, um, I, uh, I don't think it's true. But at any rate, I wanted to do the second part of this, uh, partly because, hello, Adam, I uh, neglected to talk about Ibogaine, which is extremely important, particularly for people that have opioid addictions, because um, not only does Ibogaine have this like Dutch uncle kind of personality, um, just as uh, yes, yeah, something like that. Um, just as ayahuasca is said to be feminine, um, it began as kind of harsh and mean and male. And, uh, it projects a, a very common experience is that it projects, uh, you back into your memories of childhood, not exactly in a sort of daydream reverie kind of way, but more so, um, as if, as if they're actually real, like it takes you back and you relive it. And there's something about this experience of re-attaining um, that purity of childhood uh, that results in an extremely high uh, success rate for people getting off of opiates. Um, it is kind of dangerous, people do die, um, but it's usually because they break the rules. It's really an incredible thing because if you have any heroin in your system, when you take Ibogaine, it'll kill you. It's like the war that goes on in your mortal coil is just too much. And so that's one thing to take very seriously if you're considering Ibogaine for, um, oh, and by the way, it's a, it's a root from Africa. Uh, Sananga here, the one that people put drops in their eyes when they're drinking ayahuasca is closely related. Um, Ibogaine is, um, the plant is Ib Tabernanth Iboga, I think is the Latin name. Um, and so it's an African plant and, and the root is used. So, um, I don't actually have any experience with it, but I do know the studies and I know the statistics. And one of the most amazing aspects of it is that it actually circumvents the withdrawal. 
So, you know, you don't even have to go through withdrawal, but you do have to have zero opiates or opioids in your system or you could die. And so, um, not a whole hell of a lot to say about that, except for those things. You know, if you're struggling with a heroin addiction or Oxycontin or whatever opioid, uh, or you know someone that is, their best chance of escape by a huge margin is Ibogaine. But you have to take it very seriously. You can't cheat. Um, and... I think the success rate is, is something like 90%. So, a boga, huge asset for people battling addiction, as are all psychedelics. Uh, I did make a, a video about psychedelics and addiction and withdrawal specifically, um, and you actually can minimize withdrawal symptoms with LSD, which sounds remarkable, but LSD has also been used in terminal cancer patients for pain with very good uh, results. So the first time I heard that, you know, cause I, I have health problems and I have had a dependency uh, on opiates off and on for a couple of decades. Uh, the first time somebody told me that I thought it was insane. It sounded like a nightmare, but I actually tried it um, recently because I had developed a, a physical dependency to tramadol, which I didn't know did that. I thought it was, it was just over, over the counter painkiller you can buy here. I should have done more research, uh, but I took it for a few weeks and apparently that was enough. So when I discontinued it and, you know, I wasn't even taking enough to get high or anything. I don't even know if it does get you high. I was taking, you know, the bare minimum I needed to function and still ended up with a physical dependency. So you have to be very careful. Uh, but long story short, LSD did actually, um, treat the withdrawal symptoms to a remarkable extent. Uh, so that is very valuable information for anyone. Cause I think, you know, the reason most people fail at getting off of opiates isn't even the desire to use them again. It's just that the withdrawal is so horrific, um, that most people fail. So Ibogaine, miracle, all psychedelics are helpful. Uh, but Ibogaine is the big one. Ayahuasca is also very, very good for helping with addictions. Um, and one thing I wanted to mention about ayahuasca that I didn't get to last night, and I'm sure, you know, most people that watch this are going to know. Um, but you have to be very careful about um, prescription medication, particularly SSRIs. Uh, you cannot take MDMA or cocaine before um, ayahuasca. And this is something that you really have to take seriously because people do die. Uh, the, it's very, very rare to die during an ayahuasca ceremony. But if you set yourself up for serotonin shock, it's very, very probable that you could actually die. So, um, you know, last night I was talking about how a lot of the dietas that people recommend are actually just modern innovations that, you know, a lot of it's not true. People say that if you eat meat or if you eat garlic or you eat onions, um, that you won't have an experience or that your experience will be very weak. And uh, that's actually mostly just blame shifting because the shaman didn't make his medicine strong enough. So, uh, ayahuasca is very weird. Uh, sometimes, you know, half of the circle will have a very strong experience and the other half won't for no discernible reason. So it's not even always the shaman's fault. But the reality is, uh, you know, most of the dieta as, as a preparation for ayahuasca, um, dietas as um, a practice where you're, um, consuming a certain, uh, maestra, planta maestra, uh, uh, um, you know, the, what is the, uh, Roya now the glowing, the glowing tree, or, um, I mean, there's a ton of them, the Shipibo or just, they know so much about so many different plants in the jungle. There's, there's all sorts of different dietas. The point being that if you're trying to, um, access certain types of information, or you're trying to cure a certain type of patient, uh, those diets are legitimate and traditional, but the, um, you know, avoid salt, don't eat meat, uh, no sex, all of that kind of stuff is definitely modern 
ayahuasca industry stuff that didn't exist before 1993. And I'm not trying to tell you not to do it because what happened basically is that people were dying in ceremonies sometimes and no one knew why. So they started, you know, making a, a list that just grew and grew and grew of things you shouldn't consume before ayahuasca. And once I started drinking with Schwar and realized that they eat monkeys before ayahuasca, never occurred to them not to have sex before ayahuasca, you know, I, I, I started to notice that it, it didn't really actually seem to have an effect. Um, and so I've experimented. I've eaten red meat the day of ayahuasca. It makes absolutely no difference. Um, but you do absolutely have to take seriously uh, the, the prohibition on SSRIs and prescription medications and opiates. And, um, you know, I, I know people have taken Kratom uh, without having serious adverse effects, but it sounds like it at least kind of blunts the experience. Um, so it's probably best, you know, if you can. I would say that if you have an opiate addiction and you absolutely can't stop, um, you can switch to Kratom for a couple of weeks and then, you know, start lowering the dose so that you can take the minimum that you need to not have withdrawal symptoms. And then you would be safe to try to use ayahuasca to help you get through uh, the addiction and actually treat the root of it. And the reality is that studies on addiction are showing us that it's not at all what people thought. If you actually heal the trauma, an addict can, you know, use drugs like a normal person and not necessarily revert to their old patterns. Um, I've done this myself uh, and it's, you know, research supports it. Cannabis with ayahuasca, there are a lot of people that say no, um, but it should be noted that the, I'm not sure how to say the name of the church, the Sant Santo Daimi, I think, in Brazil actually routinely smokes marijuana uh, towards the end of ayahuasca ceremonies. So, Again, a lot of this stuff just depends on who you ask. Um, there's a lot of different opinions. Um, and what I'm telling you is just, you know, based on my experience and observations, the absolutes. You know, you cannot mess with your serotonin before ayahuasca ceremony. That is dangerous. Um, chewing a little bit of coca towards the end is often very helpful and is totally fine. Uh, sometimes people will make a kind of a weak tea. Chewing too much coca uh, during ayahuasca ceremony can be... A really bad idea so you have to be very moderate about it but in my experience it can really help with the physical um you know the body load stuff and uh mental clarity and um it, it can really be a huge assist actually yopo and wilka um are it's essential for me to have coca because otherwise it'll just kind of lay you out and you're just you know you're just knocked over bowled over uh, but with a little bit of coca, you can remain kind of agile and aware, and it's, it's very, very helpful. Um, I didn't really talk about coca in the last stream because it's not technically psychedelic, but it is used uh, as an adjunct to San Pedro traditionally by a lot of tribes. Uh, some people, as I said, use it during um, ayahuasca or towards the end of an ayahuasca ceremony. Um, it's used with Wilka and Yopo, uh, and it's it's good to know that um, coca is actually one of the most nutritious plants on the planet. I actually read somewhere that uh, by weight, it has the highest uh, density of vitamins and minerals of any plants on earth. And then it has all sorts of other alkaloids that uh, cleanse. Actually, if you chew a lot of coca, your body odor will be insane within a couple of hours. And I've always just assumed that that's because you're just dumping um, toxins. So, you know, it can help with mental clarity, but you do have to be careful. People say that it's not addictive, um, but if you overchew, it can become kind of like cocaine. And uh, a lot of people do overdo it. A lot of people do develop habits. And if you chew too much, it has the opposite effect. You'll, it's like you're coming down from cocaine. Like you'll never really get high like you're on cocaine, but you'll feel like you're coming down. So it's pretty negative um, overall. So, um, all right. So some of you were asking about Amanita muscaria. I don't actually have any personal experience with it because it does not sound appealing, but I've read a lot and I can give you some warnings. Um, I have noticed there's a, a, a movement of people that seems to be gathering steam. 
people that suffer from depression and addiction that are claiming that they have used Amanita muscaria uh, with very good results. And, you know, if it worked for them, then it may be worth trying. Uh, I think it's really important to dry the Amanita first because um, I think what you want is for the muscimol to convert into ibotenic acid. Pretty sure it may be the other way around. It's been years since I've read on this, but um, at any rate, the sun drying converts the more toxic of the two into the other. And so um, Amanita is not actually technically a psychedelic. It's definitely not an indole ring compound. Uh, it's a deliriant, basically. And so the experiences are... It sounds pretty unpleasant to me, particularly at high doses. Headache, nausea, vomiting, delirium, fever, tremors. Um, but I guess if you get the dosage right and you know what you're doing... Uh, you can have visions that are very informative, and at certain doses, it's very euphoric. Um, but you have to be extremely careful. You do not ever take Amanita muscaria alone unless you're very experienced. Also, Pantherina, Amanita Pantherina is much stronger. And the danger is something called repetitive muscle syndrome. And what happens is you get, just in the same way that some psychedelics cause a loop, where you'll just keep saying the same thing over and over again for hours and hours and hours. It's happened to me. It's pretty dumb. Um, and you're barely cognizant. Like you kind of know that you're doing it, but it's, it's no fun. Loops are no fun. Um, a little bit of tobacco tea through the nose will get you out of it, by the way. Um, what was I saying about Amanita? Salvia divinorum. Yeah, we'll get to that one. Um, Oh, repetitive muscle syndrome. Um, you will just do something and then you'll do it over and over again, even if you're hurting yourself. So, you know, I've heard Andrew Weil talking about uh, at Cougar Hot Springs. He found a guy that kept climbing up onto the bridge and jumping off into the rocks. And it's 10 feet over and over and over and he couldn't stop. And then also Paul Stamets uh, had an experience where he was at a campground and he just kept dropping his phone over and over and over again and a crowd of people gathered around and he just couldn't stop doing it. So you really have to watch out for high doses of Amanita muscaria because of repetitive muscle syndrome. It's very dangerous if there's no one around to control you and you may become a danger to them because you're not really cognizant. So they may have trouble restraining you. Um, Again, I know a lot of people are using Amanita muscaria medicinally with good results. It's also part of a lot of traditions. The Sungus tribesmen in Siberia will, um, the warriors drink it uh, because they don't sun dry it and it's very toxic. And so the big strong men filter the toxins and then they pee. And then um, the rest of the people drink the pee of the warriors and it's still active. I've also heard of uh, reindeer apparently forage them so they'll drink the urine of reindeer uh, that, that may be an urban legend i'm not sure but they definitely drink the urine of the warriors uh, also the term berserker comes from vikings um consuming three uh two large open cap and one small closed cap before battle and a lot of people feel that that is why they were able to take on the five to one odds that they were famous for and so it can also be smoked, by the way. Um, so salvia divinorum is also a deliriant and uh, it's a plant, I think mostly occurs in Mexican cloud forests. Uh, it can be chewed or smoked and it is also a deliriant. Uh, the strength of it is often compared to DMT. I've only tried it once. I hated it. Most people don't like it. It's kind of like when, uh, if you've seen the first Lord of the Rings movie, when Frodo puts on the ring, it's kind of like that at moderate doses. And beyond that, I guess you can have some really wild uh, experiences, but it's very difficult physically. It's often very scary. Um, and I don't know about any therapeutic benefits. Um, Personally, I just avoid it completely. Uh, so, you know, I don't have a ton of insight on that. I do know that it's relatively safe. Um, and the visions that you have are in the order of true hallucinations where it can be difficult to distinguish actual reality from what's happening. So both Amanita muscaria and Salvia divinorum are, are more deliriant than actual psychedelic and... Um, 
both of them are basically hard passes for me. Um, oh, and I wanted to mention for those of you that are really committed to um, plant medicine, plant-based compounds, it depends on the type of addiction um, lantern. But let me finish this um, sassafras thought and then, and then I'll, I'll mention that again. But a lot of people don't want to take anything synthetic, uh, which I think is kind of a shame because I think LSD has uses that a lot of the other plant medicines uh, can't really do for you. Um, and, and it's just different. It's, it's all of the, the interesting thing about all the plant-based uh, um, psychedelics is that they all seem to have their own personality and even a mind of their own. It's like being in contact with something other. Uh, with the mushrooms, people describe it, you know, as kind of alien and goofy, cosmic joke kind of. Um, ayahuasca is generally perceived as feminine, although not always. And, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a healing, emotional, motherly kind of uh, energy. Ibogaine is male and mean and, you know, um, so they all have personalities. And uh, LSD to me seems like it's just you. But it's great in, in the, for the purposes of like introspective um, work. So I, no, San Pedro is, yeah, it's a psychedelic, but it is in the same chemical family as MDMA. Um, it's not in the same family as LSD, psilocybin. Um, but mescaline is probably closer to uh, LSD than MDMA and it's, in the experience. Um, social anxiety, I mean, that, that could be addressed a number of ways. Um, the, one of the things that you would need to ascertain is what the cause is. Was it abuse as a child? Um, you know, if so, what type of abuse? You, you have to look at the root causes, I think, to really figure out what's going to be the most efficacious uh, medicine to deal with something. But any one of these compounds can help with social anxiety. MDMA um, is the first thing that comes to mind. And um, that's what we're talking about. And so there is a couple of options, or there are a couple of options for plant-based MDMA, although it's not exactly the same. Um, but sassafras, some of you may have heard of, it's, it's usually like a peanut butter colored uh, gunk, I guess. And the effects of it are very similar to MDMA. Um, and it comes from the sassafras root. It actually still smells like, like sassafras. Hippies call it sass. Uh, and so if you're really feeling like you need the benefits of MDMA, but you're really opposed to uh, chemicals, then sassafras is an option. Uh, I think it's actually pretty easy to make, although it's probably illegal, so you guys have to do your own research there. Uh, but I did want to mention that it is a little bit different in its effect. It's a little bit more psychedelic and a little bit less amphetamine like. And I also personally think it's a lot less effective than chemical MDMA. I'm not a person that advocates for absolute natural all the time, no matter what. I think that it's possible for humans to do good things. And I think that MDMA and LSD are great examples of, you know, humans collaborating with nature to produce something worthwhile. Uh, it, my favorite way to use MDMA, though, is definitely half and half sassafras, MDMA, and usually 100 micrograms of LSD. That's like the holy trinity. Um, that an amazing experience, especially for couples. Uh, the sexual enhancement is... You don't even know what sex is until you've done that, in my opinion. Um, so... So there's that. But yeah, for social anxiety, I mean, what you have to do fundamentally is get to the root of, of the cause and address that. So if you've suppressed the memory, then you may need ayahuasca or, you know, even ketamine uh, um, can, can do that a lot of times. Any one of the, the psychedelics, you know, and what's appropriate is really going to depend on the cause again. Um, but MDMA is probably the most efficacious for developing self-love and empathy for other people. And the thing is that all of our relations with all other, with our external environment are reflective. And so uh, the experience of developing more empathy for another person is going to facilitate um, developing more empathy for yourself uh, as long as it's healthy. So 
<clears throat> um, we talked about Coca just a little bit. We talked about Wilka. We covered ketamine last night. Oh, LSA from Morning Glory. Somebody mentioned that in the comments yesterday, uh, and it was incorrect, so I just wanted to um, offer this to that person. Uh, LSA is not actually the precursor to um, LSD, but it is the first time and maybe the only time. I haven't followed the, the, that thread to see if it's happened again, but it's the first time that a chemical was synthesized in the laboratory before it was found in nature. And it is an analog of LSD, but LSD is lysergic di diethylamide tartrate 25, right? 25 is only the, the sequence. Um, it was the 25th ergot derivative. Uh, so it, it doesn't have any chemical meaning. Um, and LSA is lysergic acid amide. So it's almost the same compound. Uh, if you're going to experiment with morning glories, though, you have to get organic seeds because they are coated in pesticides and insecticides that can make you sick. If you eat the heavenly blue variety and you turn blue, don't freak out. There's actually a lot of the dye that makes the flowers blue when they bloom already in the seeds. And the first time I ate them, I didn't know that. Started turning blue. Freaked me the hell out. Wasn't even really tripping. I'm like, Oh, great. We poisoned ourselves for nothing, you know, but I noticed I didn't really feel too bad or anything. So the, the book from the thumbnail, I went and got it. I had the wherewithal to do that, flipped it open and, and it tells you in there, you know, don't worry if you turn blue. Um, but another issue <clears throat> with the morning glory seeds, and this is a problem with all plant based psychedelics, is that getting a dose, a specific dose is very difficult. And it's a very common experience for people to take way too much LSA. So uh, rather than eating the seeds, uh, which you have to soak because they're really, really hard, you can't digest them uh, for 24 hours. And I think a strong dose is usually recommended to be 500. Uh, if you're going to use Hawaiian wood rose, the baby Hawaiian wood rose, I think it's three to four seeds. Um, it's probably better to go through like the basic extraction process, which can be done with just alcohol. I think it's pretty simple. And then you get like a yellow powder. And then at least you can... Um, measure your doses a little bit more accurately. Uh, we didn't talk about peyote because we did talk about San Pedro. And although they're not exactly the same, they're very similar. Uh, one of the fundamental differences is that peyote is much more difficult to dose and it's also got much more toxic compounds in it. So the vomiting is much more intense. Um, it's said that the little tufts of hair are what contains lofoferine, which is an analog of cyanide. Pretty sure it's cyanide. Or is it the one that starts with it? No, it's cyanide. Um, so it's very, very toxic. Uh, but I, I don't know if any essays have been done to see if that's actually true. But if you're going to eat peyote, you may want to pull those off just in case. Um, and also, there are all sorts of um, phenethylamines in San Pedro that aren't present in the peyote cactus. So it's going to be a little bit different of an experience, but basically the same. Um, Detura is a hard pass. Avoid. I think we got to that in the last one. Um, so that's pretty much it guys. I, I, I think, you know, I just wanted to jump on real quick because I did totally missed, um, well, look, I'm not saying Detura can't be used as a medicine. I'm not saying that it isn't, um, potentially useful. In fact, atropine is, is one of the alkaloids. Um, it's used to restart the heart. Uh, after heart attacks, uh, scopolamine is used in seasickness medicine, and um, PCP really has got nothing to do with anything. I, I don't, I mean, not this this conversation because I don't think it really has any benefits. Um, I've smoked it when I was a teenager, uh, and it's really weird. It's kind of like ghetto LSD or something. Like everything kind of melts, and you know, you can black out really easily. Um, I, I, I would just avoid, I think, uh, PCP. Um, but, you know, so Detura, I'm sure, has its uses. Uh, the thing is, you have to make sure that if you're going to go that route, that you... Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, smudging it, s s smoking it is safer, for sure. Because then you're not just consuming it and seeing what happens. You know what I mean? Smoking it is definitely safer. 
Uh, and I'm not familiar with therapeutic um, applications of, of Datura. I'm sure they exist. There are specifically shamans here that only work with Datura. In the jungle, there are actually like areas where for like a quarter mile, it's nothing but Toei, the, the hanging giant white uh, Brumansia, which is related to Datura. Um, and also some of the shamans here will put a flower or two in their ayahuasca when they cook it. But I, I just avoid because of the dangerous element of it. Um, it's actually one of the ingredients that's used to make zombies uh, in Haiti. Uh, this is a really interesting story. There's a book by Wade Davis, who was a student of Richard Evan Schultes, who was kind of like the psychedelic Indiana Jones. He was a Harvard professor, I think, of anthropology, but he was basically, basically an ethnobotanist. Uh, he was one of the people that really kickstarted the entire psychedelic movement. Uh, he went to South America and got lost in the jungle for like 12 years at one point. When they found him, he was pulling a, like a dragging a cart behind him with like 12,000 species of plants, a whole shit ton of, um, of new species, the blue orchid, this almost microscopic blue orchid and all this stuff. And, um, so Wade Davis was one of his students and he heard about the zombie phenomena in Haiti and he decided he, he wanted to investigate and see what it was. And it turns out that zombies are real. And the witch doctors in Haiti, the way that they create them is that they make this powder um, that is a combination of blowfish poison, datura, and a bunch of other plants. And it's extremely potent and extremely toxic. And uh, supposedly they can just sprinkle it across your doorstep because everyone's barefoot. And if you even walk in it, it's enough. Um, that part of the story sounds a little bit iffy to me, but that's what the book says, uh, serpent in the rainbow. I don't know if I mentioned the title. And so what happens is you become death. Like, um, I don't know if it would work as well now that we have better technology. Um, but they would pronounce you dead and then you're buried. And then the length of time between like how long you're buried before the, the witch doctor comes and digs you up and gives you the antidote determines how brain dead you are. So they have all these slaves down there that they call zombies, and that's how they're created uh, with Datura and blowfish and some other toxins. So, um, yeah, and, you know, generally as far as like a psychedelic experience, it sounds pretty terrifying. I've seen video of kids that were in a police station. They were smoking a cigarette that wasn't really there and trying to tear posters off the walls. And later they said that they both saw a pile of dead bodies, many of whom they recognized. Then it just suddenly stacked like all the way to the ceiling and, you know, it looked totally real. So, um, also I, I did try Jimson weed once, just one and a half of the seed pods when I was a kid. And I think it permanently damaged my eyesight. I can't be sure that that's the cause, but I couldn't, I couldn't see well enough to read a book for like a week and I don't think it ever fully recovered. Uh, and all that really happened is that my throat was so dry, I couldn't swallow anything. You know, it was really, very difficult to stay hydrated. I think it's just generally a bad idea. So um, that's about it, guys. I mean, I think I've covered all of the uh, the stuff that I missed last night. Please do hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon. There are options in the chat and in the description for PayPal, Zelle, and cryptocurrency. Um, if you want to go that route, we really do appreciate the support because we've been demonetized. Um, and so if there's no questions, uh, I think I'm going to sign out. Okay, guys, thank you so much for spending this time with me. And we will um, wait, Lantern, didn't you ask me something I didn't answer? I'm sorry. I, it was something about the different different types of, of psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, just real quickly, I'll say something about that because there is, or there, there are noticeable differences, I think. Um, for example, if you don't like the body load of Cubensis, uh, Liberty caps tend to be really light and fluffy and airy sort of, they don't make you feel heavy. Um, there are distinct differences in the effects of the wood rotters versus the, um, coprophilic, uh, oh yeah. Addiction. Uh, um, so there, you know, in my experience, there's a difference between the wood rotters and the coprophilic ones, the shit lovers, uh, the, the wood rotters tend to be more like DMT in their effect, uh, mild DMT, I guess. 
Um, but I think it's a matter of personal preference. You know, you have to be aware that if you're going to eat Azurescians, that they cause paralysis the next day, oftentimes, and don't get scared. It'll go away. It's totally harmless, but it is scary when it happens if you don't know why it's happening. Um, and then addiction, you know, I talked about this a lot in the last stream, but I'll just mention real quick again that, you know, you can use a combination of pranayama uh, as a breathing technique and moderate doses of LSD to quit smoking, quit doing cocaine, uh, really to repattern anything that you need to in the brain. And it can be done very, very rapidly uh, with a little bit of practice. And at some point, I'll make a, a video going into detail, but it's not really very complicated. Um, so learn pranayama. And you can use LSD or psilocybin to repattern the brain very, very rapidly. If it's an opiate addiction, then um, you can use uh, kratom to sort of get out of it. Uh, and then when the withdrawals are relatively minor, lessen your kratom and uh, drink ayahuasca. Or you have to completely stop doing everything cold turkey, and then you can take Ibogaine, uh, which will actually neutralize the withdrawals. And there's like a 90% success rate. Um, so again, it depends, you know, MDMA, uh, uh, because of the empathy enhancement, it's really important to figure out what the root cause of your addictions, because they're all trauma based, um, 100% of the time. So, uh, that's the first thing, you know, like what, what is it that caused the addiction in the first place, get to the root of it, pull it up by the roots. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not really until you have, have, have isolated the cause uh, that you can really choose the best medicine. Um, although taking any of these medicines could help to facilitate the discovery of the, uh, the trauma if you're not sure what it was. So one more time, guys, hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon or one of the options in the uh, chat or the description. And thank you so much for spending this time with me. We will be back again very soon. I was going to talk about um, the myths of ayahuasca industry, but we're going to do that uh, as the topic of the next stream, I think. So thanks again, guys, and we'll see you later.